Okay, we're gonna get started. Uh, thank you for coming, first of all. Uh, this is a lot of people, so I'm kind of nervous. Uh, my name is Mate, nice to meet you. Hopefully we'll get to chat after the presentation. Uh, feel free to grab me. I love talking about Rust, VR, uh, 3D engines, all sorts of stuff. Uh, can you all hear me, by the way? Yeah. Is this loud enough? Okay, cool. Um, let's see what else. We have a couple of admins trivia. So uh, yeah, my name is Mate. Uh, feel free to add me on LinkedIn. If you want to contact me, you can message me on uh, meetup.com. And special thanks to Braid, uh, where I work, for helping me organize this meetup. Uh, thank you for coming. And also, uh, please uh, welcome Paul Masurel, who is going to tell us about uh, his work on QuickWit and Tantiv, and who actually used to run, uh, among other people, this uh, Tokyo Rust meetup, right? Uh, yeah, I wasn't that involved actually, <laughs> but uh, yes, I, I think I, I'm listening. Okay, with well, the it, it said on meetup.com that you were one of the organizers, yeah. so this is uh, formally passing the torch. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Paul Mazurel. I uh, usually go by the handle name Filmy Coton on uh, GitHub, Twitter, and usual social networks. I'm the CEO of QuickWits. Uh, yeah, I, I'm gonna try this. I think it's gonna be a very lonely experience, but uh, how many people have heard of QuickWit? Two, not, not too bad. <laughs> uh, what about Tant TV? Three, four, okay. <laughs> so uh, not so much. Uh, hopefully at the end of the presentation, you, you will be able to to know a little bit more about uh, those two projects. Uh, so QuickWit is a search engine company. We are building a distributed search engine. You can think of it as a fresh uh, alternative to something like Elasticsearch if you are trying to in, uh, index logs. So we are specialized on append only data. We are very bad if you are trying to modify your data set a lot. We cannot back, for instance, uh, uh, e-commerce website or something like that. We are more on the other end of the spectrum of search engines. We are more into in making it possible for you to index terabytes, hundreds of terabytes, petabytes of logs, and uh, still be able to search it relatively fast. And most importantly, on the cheap. We are way cheaper than other solutions. Uh, that's what we do. So uh, yeah, we love open source and we love open source stuff as well. So we are entirely built in Rust. And uh, I didn't list all of the crates that we use because there's too many of them. But I listed uh, some of the crates that we contributed. So QuickWit is not a library. Uh, it's our project, a distributed search engine, it's entirely open source. And then there is TV, which is uh, <laughs> I, yeah, it's a, it's a search engine library that is a little bit famous in the Rust world and also in the search world. Uh, it's an equivalent of Lucene, if you are familiar with Lucene from the Java world. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we also have contributed the, the Levenstein Automata um, crate, which is a crate with Levenstein Automata, <laughs> if you are into that kind of things. Uh, Chit Chat is a library to make it possible to do cluster formation. So you have a bunch of machines and you want to be able to have them know about each other uh, and maybe show, share some uh, small states. Uh, you can use ChitChat for that and it will uh, detect, for instance, if uh, one, one, one machine is, uh, dies and needs to leave the cluster. It's done through gossiping. Um, the bit packing crate is about integer compression, very efficient one. We'll talk a little bit about that in the presentation. And the search benchmark, uh, the game, uh, so that's a project. That's, yeah, so that's, uh, that's our project. Be nice, and uh, at the end of the presentation, click the star button. <laughs> we love stars, we collect them like Pokemon. Uh, yeah, uh, so the search, Benchmark the game, uh, it looks like this. And it's kind of a differential benchmark testing different search engine. Uh, if you have your own search engine, you can add it to the benchmark relatively easy. It's easily, it's not specific to Rust. Uh, so you have 
Lucine in there. Bliv is written in Golang. Lucine is uh, written in uh, Rust, the one on the right here. And uh, what's interesting in this benchmark is that you can choose different kind of queries. For instance, here we are just uh, trying to fetch the 10 best documents, but you can pick like uh, 10 best, but also you want to count the documents, which is very different because it means that you need to go through the entire docs, uh, doc set and just count the documents. And uh, usually TonTV is doing really well. So um, it's, if you, if you play with it, uh, you will see that actually PISA is faster. PISA is a C++ uh, project run by academics and is the fastest uh, search engine that I know of. Um, yeah, and apart from that, PonTV is the fastest that I know of. Um, yeah, so one question that, we, that I usually get uh, when I talk about PonTV is, People ask me what, what, what makes it fast. And usually I think they have some kind of agenda, like they, they, they want me to say that it sucks to Rust and that Java sucks. Uh, and <laughs> it's actually more complicated than this. And the goal of this presentation is uh, to explain a little bit about uh, what makes Ton TV fast, because uh, usually I only have five minutes to answer this question, and that's more a 40 minutes question. Um, Yeah, so we are going to just discuss a little bit about what TonTV is, uh, and then discuss what makes uh, TonTV fast, and then I will talk a little bit about qu what QuickWit is, and what makes it cost efficient. And feel free to interrupt me if you have questions in the middle. If you just want to say, this is wrong, uh, please do so. That's perfectly fine. Uh, we are small enough communities that we can do that kind of stuff. Okay, so Tan TV, um, it's a library, so you you cannot use it as a standalone program. It's something that you add to your program because you are building a search engine or you are building some kind of OLAP engine or whatnot. And uh, usually your program looks like this. So you define uh, your schema uh, first. So you, here I, I just have one field and it's uh, it's text. Uh, and then you have to index your documents. So the important piece here is that it's done in batch. So usually you will want to uh, append as many documents as you want to the index and then call commit uh, to get uh, uh, an important throughput, indexing throughput. And you can, to, to give you an idea, so TonTV is very fast at indexing. It's way faster than all of the engines that we've seen uh, in the list before. And I think the second one would be Lucene, and I think TonTV is often like three times faster than Lucene on, at, at indexing. Um, yeah, you, you, to, to give you an idea, indexing the English Wikipedia, so that's about um, eight gigabytes of data. It takes uh, four minutes and a half on my laptop. So yeah, you, you can index volumes of data with, uh, with Stone TV uh, very nicely. Uh, so on the search side, it will look like this. You have to open uh, your index, so you pass it a directory, and then uh, you write your query and your search. So yeah, here, I think the interesting thing is that we pass the query, and then we path we pass a um, so-called collector that defines what we want to do with the search results. So it's possible to, to say that you are interested into aggregating some statistics, uh, or maybe you are just interested in the search results, or maybe you want some count, uh, I don't know. And you can plug your own implementation of a collector in there. So it's, uh, it's, 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 it's uh, possible to extend the library by easy. Uh, so, what makes it fast? So, first, uh, sorry for, uh, so first, uh, it's not just a matter of rewriting stuff in Rust. Uh, so, Lucene, like Lucene with an R, uh, is a project um, 
from a Chinese company. Uh, they just rewrote Lucene in, uh, in Rust. And they ended up with a solution that is actually slower than Lucene all over the board. So, and, and, and it's, it's not the first time actually. There was also an effort called C Lucene uh, that was a, a re implementation in C, and it was also slower than Lucene. So, you cannot just like take the, the code base and do a translation and, and everything will be fast. Uh, things just do not work that way. You have to write actual Rust code to to get performance, and then if you want great performance, you will have to, to sweat a little bit. So, um, yeah, I, I have trouble answering this question in five minutes, so it's gonna take a little bit of time, because it's not one silver bullet, it's actually a bunch of, uh, of lead bullets, and I try to list all of them. So, yeah, of course, algorithm and data structures. That one is, um, Usually when I write something in, uh, in Tom TV, I, my default is to copy what is done in Lucene. So most of the algorithm are actually the same as in Lucene. It's not true everywhere, but uh, almost everywhere. So that's not really what makes, for most of the uh, search benchmarks, it's not what makes us faster. The index format, um, it's close to Lucene, but we will see that it differs in some way. Uh, so there is one point which is, um, it's generally speaking, if you, if, if you write a search engine in Java, you will have a very hard time because, you know, Java will force you to, uh, for instance, uh, box your integers or, or stuff like that when you work with collections. So we'll have, you will have basically to rewrite every single collection. Um, and that's what Lucene does. In Rust, uh, I'm able to pull stuff from the standard library. Usually you get the best in-class implementation and it's fast out of the box. So here it's like, like just a straight uh, win from Rust and, and it's, uh, it's amazing. Um, and so one point that I rarely hear about is Rust is uh, optimization friendly. So what's magical with a language like Rust or C or C++ is that you can write your code, maybe it's not as fast as Java, but you can, or maybe it's just as fast as Java and it's not faster, but you can then uh, look for the hot piece of code that you have and you can focus on it. Maybe it's uh, just 10 lines of code and you can go way above the performance that you were getting from Java because you have all of the tools that you want uh, to do it. So we will discuss about that. One very important part also in, uh, in my job is Rust makes it very simple to make a difference between static dispatch and dynamic dispatch. We'll talk a little bit about that too. And then we have access to CMD instructions. And so the order here is not entirely random. So I, I tend to talk on the internet a little bit too much about CMD instructions. So people believe that our source code is uh, plagued with CMD instructions. That's not true at all. We have just a few lines of uh, CMD instructions, instructions sprinkled over the, the code base, uh, but they are very important. And after writing this list, I'm not cheating there, uh, after writing this, li this list, I noticed that there was one very tiny example where I was actually uh, covering every single one of these points all at once, except the one about the less hoops to jump into, blah, 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 to get the right thing and it's intersections. So once, and, and I, I'm gonna sim simplify stuff and I will consider just running a query over the intersection of two, two terms, uh, hello and world. So it seems like a very simple uh, problem. I suspect that a lot of you already know what an inverted index is, but I, I will still explain a little bit how, how it works. Um, so in Tom TV, when you add a document, it gets a document ID. Document ID is an unsigned, uh, unsigned 32 bit integer and it's just uh, auto incremented. So the first document gets doc ID zero, the second one gets doc ID one. It's as simple as this. And an inverted index is just like a map from terms. Uh, so here, hello and world. Uh, to a so-called posting list, and a posting list is just a sorted list of doc IDs. So it's as simple as this. 
Um, and so now we have two questions. Uh, we, we're not going to discuss about the term dictionary part, so we are not going to discuss about how the terms are sorted and how we associate the terms to the posting list. So we will focus on how we uh, lay out on the disk the posting list, so the list of doc IDs containing hello and containing uh, world, and how we compute the intersection of these uh, two posting lists. So it sounds like a very simple problem. We could probably wrap it up in, uh, in, in, in 30 minutes if it was a programming interview, uh, but you will see that it's actually much deeper than what you might expect. So first, how do we compress? How do we lay out the data on the list? So we want to compress stuff, and we use a first trick that is uh, very common in a search engine. We do delta compression. So I said that the doc IDs were sorted in the list. So instead of sorting off, uh, storing the doc ID directly, we store the difference between two consecutive doc IDs. Uh, very simple trick. The point there is that we get integers that are smaller and every single uh, integer compression method that you might know of are relying on the idea that the integer are rather small and so you don't have to burn 32 bits to store them. And then on top of doing that, we use a compression that is relatively simple, that is called bit packing. Uh, the idea is you group your doc IDs by blocks of 128 integers and you notice that the largest one may be, I don't know, 15. If it's 15, then you know that you can represent every single one of this integer of four bits. So you store this metadata about the block. You, you, you just store the fact that this block is encoded over four bits and you only use four bits per uh, integer. Very, very simple. Um, but then, so there is a trick that I didn't detail here to, uh, write the integer uh, on, on the disk in such an order that it makes it very easy to do this bit packing and this bit unpacking and this uh, delta integration, so the operation of getting the doc IDs from the delta encoded uh, docs. Um, there is a way to do that with uh, CMD instructions. I didn't invent it, it's a, it's a method that was uh, published by uh, Daniel Lemire, uh, which is very famous in, in the very small domain of uh, integer compression. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so this method uh, makes it possible to decompress 6.5 billion to 9 billion integer per second. So in this kind of work, it's very important to um, keep an idea of what are the order of magnitudes that you should expect. 9 billion of integer per second, it's a laptop. Um, the frequency of my CPU, it varies between 1.6 and uh, uh, it can spike at 3 gigahertz or something like that. So yeah, it's, it's extremely fast. And so in, in terms of memory, we are flirting with the bandwidth of memory if it was uncompressed. So uh, I'm using DDR3 here, the, the bandwidth is uh, uh, no, it's DDR4, but uh, if it was DDR3, for instance, uh, the bandwidth is 12 gigabytes per second. And yeah, we, we are, if it was like four bytes per integers, we are already above this, so it's, uh, it, it's quite neat. Um, so yeah, if you are interested in, uh, in this, you can, uh, so the bitpacking crate uh, implements all this. And it also implements the methods for different SIMD uh, instruction sets. So here we are very conservative. We use SAC3 instructions. But if your CPU does not have this instruction set, we sniff it at runtime and we have a different implementation uh, for this CPU. And if it's at compile time, then the routine for SAC3, of course, will not be compiled at all. So it, I think it's interesting to know how the kind of stuff is done. Uh, and then there is also uh, an implementation that was added recently for uh, ARM. So, yeah. Uh, so, okay, so now uh, with this, we have an iterator of blocks of uh, doc IDs. So it's one block is 128 doc IDs. Uh, so we could build uh, very easily an iterator over doc IDs, like 
flat map, right? And, <laughs> and uh, treat that as, let's compute the intersection of two sorted iterators. That's like a super common interview question, right? So, yeah, I, I wrote like the typical answer for this. I, I think it's called like merging or zipping two iterators. Uh, yeah, I, I wrote the right version because it's much simpler than like introducing like pickable iterators and doing weird stuff like that, but you get the idea. Because the integers are, uh, the iterators are sorted, you just uh, identify which iterator is, uh, actually I, I wrote the union here, I made a mistake. <laughs> so there is no, uh, there is no push uh, here and here. So yeah, I did that right before the, I did that today actually. Uh, but you get the idea, you, you advance the uh, iterator that is uh, lagging behind and when the two iterators are on the same element, then you know that it's in the intersection and you can add it to the output. So the first version of Pantv we are doing this and the search benchmark was already there. So we had a point of comparison with uh, Lucene and the search benchmark is great because it gives you uh, results like that are not a very simple benchmark that would be an average of our set of queries. It gives you result per queries. And so uh, Tantv was doing extremely bad, like it was up to six times slower than Lucene on very specific queries. And I, I, I gave you an example here, which is uh, the, the and Incredibles, so the intersection of uh, the and Incredibles. And yeah, so the interactive part of the, the presentation, can you guys think what could be the reason why it's not very efficient to do this? People don't tell you that in interviews, right? It, it's a very bad way to do intersection over uh, iterators sometimes. Sorry? Because it's O of n linear. The complexity is O of n. Oh, yeah, the O of n is not that bad, right? Yeah, but it's just, you can just do bit masking. You can just what? Bit, bit masking and no, bit, bit comparing. Uh, so it's, it's, yeah, it's uh, bit, bit, bit masking is not happening uh, there in Lucene or Tantv, but yeah, you can do you can do better here. So the trouble here is that the is it's a posting list that contains every single doc ID in your dataset basically. Uh, so dataset is Wikipedia, and you can expect that every single document will have the in it. Incredibles not so much, and so you have a document frequency that is way larger here and not here. And so uh, if you look at the algorithm that we had before, Tantivi and Lucene uh, are using uh, some kind of uh, skip index to, to make it better. So the way we do this in Lucene, uh, in Tantivi, is we have a companion index to this posting list that just stores uh, for each so it's, it's a list and you get for each block the last document in the block and then uh, the block offset. I'm, I'm lying a little bit, but that's it. And so when you are trying to seek for a document, so you know that your other leg is already at uh, document 1000, you don't need to go plus one, plus one, plus one. What you do is that you seek into this um, data structure and you can go directly to the block that might actually contain your document. So it's much faster. Uh, and so I, I was a little bit, uh, I, I, when I, I knew about the problem, but I saw that um, block decompression was so fast that it wouldn't be a problem. Uh, but actually it really shows up in the benchmark, so I had to implement that. Uh, so now our intersection uh, looks a little bit more like this, so we have, a doc set trait and we have a seek uh, function that takes a target, so you, you, it's a target document. So like you do your intersection, you're gonna call it with, like if you have two legs, two, two terms, two posting lists, uh, and the first posting list is at document 23, you call the seek on the other leg and you see if, uh, if you went past this uh, document or if you actually reach the document, in which case 
uh, that's your next document in the intersection. Uh, so nothing too uh, complicated, I hope. Uh, now we have another question. So we have a, uh, an index to be able to identify what will be the right blocks, the blocks that might contain our documents. How do we seek into this block? So we have a block of 128 documents and we want to see what is the document that is uh, right after the document that we are seeking. So we are trying to implement uh, this function here. Which is the part where we seek the block and now we, we need to call seek into, in, into the right block. Uh, so the possible version would be to do a binary search and that makes absolute, absolute sense. Um, of course, uh, here I, I didn't put uh, an array that is sized to 128 because maybe we are in the middle of the block and it's actually smaller than maybe the last document that we looked was, uh, I don't know, at, 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 the, at half of the block. So we can search into a smaller uh, block. So that's, that's a perfectly reasonable implementation. We can be a little bit more fancy and think, uh, oh, it's a, it's a little bit too much to, to search into the entire block. We can start by an exponential search. That's a very common trick in, in, in that kind of search. We do an exponential search to, to find a value that is past the document, the document that we are searching. And then we follow by a binary search uh, into this reduced array. That makes sense too. And at one point, that was the implementation in, uh, in TonTV. What about this implementation? Uh, so if I'm asking, obviously, it's the fastest implementation of the three. <laughs> um, so it really looks like the binary search. Actually, it's a, I, I just re-implemented binary search, right? That's what it, that's what it is. Uh, so it, it's, it just... Uh, almost like the one that you have in the standard library. Uh, so one big difference here, here is first, I didn't try to be smart here and pass an array. I pass the entire block all of the time, uh, which means that uh, I know exactly what is the size of the array uh, in the beginning, which means that Rust will be able to totally unroll the loop, which is a good news. And then the second thing is um, it's uh, the, the way it's implemented makes it so that it's actually uh, possible for the, the compiler to be branchless. Uh, so this code, you, you have an if statement here, but actually this code is transformed in such a way that it's, uh, it, it's, it's actually doing starts uh, plus equal and then the value that is uh, obtained by a conditional move on a pivot uh, smaller than target. So if you look into, uh, too bad. <laughs> ah yeah, I, I didn't have access to the internet. Um, yeah, if you look at the, assembly code that is generated. Uh, so I, I am sure you, you don't look at that uh, necessarily every day, but uh, the code is, there is no loop. So the first uh, key takeaway. And uh, there is no branch either, as you can see. And the branch was replaced by the C move uh, that you can see here. Uh, so if you plug that into, okay, I don't have the link, uh, too bad. So if you're gonna have to believe me on that one, uh, but if you plug that into a CPU simulator like UICA, it gives you a throughput of uh, nine cycles per iteration. So it's only nine cycles to search into your uh, 128 uh, integer, which is really nice. So it was added uh, last year and it was before the implementation was another implementation that I didn't show here that was using SIMD uh, linear search. And we obtained a 10% speed improvement with this extremely simple implementation. So that was a, a very nice win. 
So Rust is low, low level optimization friendly. Uh, it's very common for me to like copy paste code in Godbolt or use uh, cargo show ISM. So I, I don't know if you guys use uh, cargo ISM. Uh, so there is a new project that gives a, a slightly nicer output called cargo show ISM. It's great. Uh, I recommend it, you to use it if you want to look into the assembly that uh, Rust is generating. Uh, UICA.uops.info is a website that gives you access to a tool where you can copy paste assembly and see how it's actually executed on your CPU. It's a CPU simulator and gives you an idea of uh, what is a uh, bottleneck at a very low level and, and how much uh, performance you should expect on on, uh, on your CPU. Uh, yeah, I, I, of course you want to profile but that's not specific to Rust. Uh, so I use, often use cargo frame graph because it's useful and you can use perf. Hotspot is a, is a GUI for, for profiling. Um, Criterion is nice for macro batch mark. And yeah, the usual suspects in our case, it's often uh, the inlining that is not happening. You thought it was happening, but it's not. Uh, branchy code and uh, location, those would be, I guess, uh, the most common usual suspects. Uh, you might have noticed uh, when I showed uh, like DocSet implementation, the next in intersection uh, that I was showing this, and yeah, so the I, I'm here. I, I was passing uh, a trait, uh, a trait object, which means that uh, so so first the reason for why there is a, a trait here, even though I'm only talking about posting this. It's because uh, we actually have other implementation of doc sets. So for instance, uh, we have one doc set that is used for um, fuzzy term queries. So it's a doc set that shows you all of the documents that contain a term that is at Levenstein distance two of another term, for instance. Uh, so we have different implementation of this doc set trait. And uh, so a, a trait object, uh, you might know that it's not great for performance. The reason for that is that most of the time you will end up with uh, dynamic dispatch uh, at, at runtime. And uh, it's making a, the life of your compiler extremely hard when you use dynamic dispatch. So for instance, the compiler will not be able to do inlining and it will not be able to, to do all kinds of uh, optimization following inlining. Uh, so, yeah, actually, uh, the code is a tiny bit more complicated. So, we have an intersection struct that is implementing doc set, and this implementation struct uh, uses generics to say, oh, okay, I, actually, I know what is the type of the first and the second uh, doc set that I'm trying to intersect. And then there is a Others doc set because it's it's actually in charge of doing the intersection of more than two doc sets, uh, and then we when we parse the query of a user and we convert it into a query, we actually do a little bit of uh, inspection on the type of the doc set that we have, and if we see that we have the for instance the tem score uh, the yeah the tem score type for the doc set of the two first values, then we build a specialized uh, intersection object. So you, you have uh, code in the intersection.rs files, but I guess my, my key takeaway here is if you want performance, uh, don't be scared of trying to get static dispatch uh, yeah, and do specialized code. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about QuickWit as well. Um, so yeah, Quick, QuickWit is uh, so the, the, the actual product of my company, uh, and we are trying to build a cost-efficient log search engine. So uh, one first question that I get asked is, uh, what's special about log search? So what, why not just distributed search? Uh, 
So uh, focusing on log search, and actually log search, is, it's not really log search, it's Apple only data search. Um, so we focus just on immutable data, uh, which means that we can also work on uh, chat messages, for instance, or we can work on, uh, if you wanted to have, a, if, you, if you have an immutable data set, like a snapshot of the web, like Common Core, we, you, you can use QuickWit as well, it's, uh, it's perfectly fine. The thing that we cannot do is modify a document that is already in the, in the base. Uh, so yeah, we, we focus on this because it makes it possible for us to cut some corners and, and, and be more efficient. So we don't, uh, focusing on log search means that we don't care about search quality. Uh, people usually don't care about the order of the documents when they search for logs, or rather they're asking for an order that is more like, oh, I want them uh, order by time, and they have a very specific idea of what kind of log uh, should come back, so it's not like relevancy, it's, uh, it's much simpler. Second point is that it's very cost sensitive, so people who are searching terabytes of logs, they really care about how much uh, it costs. It's not the case if you are, let's say, an e-commerce website that has a search engine generating billions of revenue, you're not really trying to optimize 10% away from your CPU because it's, it's your money maker and it's really not that much money you are spending on your server, so you just want the best result possible. Uh, it's immutable and it's really helpful for a bunch of optimization. Uh, it's gigantic volumes and very few uh, queries, uh, which means that if you were to look into what your CPU is spent on your Elasticsearch cluster and you are indexing a lot of logs, usually very little CPU is spent on searching your all of the stuff that you're doing is indexing, 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 uh, and we are very good at this. Um, and yeah, also, usually you have, let's say that you are searching into application logs, you usually have uh, different applications, or maybe you are a company, a SaaS company hosting uh, logs, then maybe you have tenants. So you have this notion of when a search query is applied, you're actually uh, searching into only one part of the index. Uh, so you are either multi-index or multi-tenant, and that's also something that we are very good at uh, exploiting. So what makes QuickWit uh, cost efficient? TonTV first. Uh, TonTV is uh, fast and it's really helpful for us, especially on the indexing side, which unfortunately I didn't discuss. Uh, and then the second thing, which is uh, actually used, uh, huge, is the fact that it's kind of our secret sauce, it's uh, the thing that makes us very different. We make it possible to store your index on Amazon S3, so you don't have to do this thing where you have a bunch of server with uh, very expensive SSD tied to the server, uh, and, and you have to have your server to, to handle replication on their own. We put all of our data to Amazon S3, so we are paying only $25 per terabyte, and it's already replicated, it's super safe, uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's great. And uh, so the difficulty is just to get good performance out of it, and uh, we, we have a bunch of tricks uh, to do that. We, so I, I called it segmented based indexing because that's the way it's uh, called in the Lucene world. Uh, but so for instance, if we compare ourselves to a product like Elastic, Elastic is doing uh, document based replication, which means you, when you are trying to uh, index something, you push a document, the document is sent to all of your replicas and the work of indexing, so like building the index, it happens on every single replica. So you, if you have a uh, one plus two server uh, do, doing this work, you are paying three times. So it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's so really a waste of money and a waste of resources. Uh, so here I meant segment-based replication, not uh, indexing. Uh, search and indexing are running on different hardware. I will, ex it, it's, uh, it's not a well-known fact, and it's, uh, but, but it's very important to do that. I will explain why in a, in a la uh, later slide. 
because of our architecture, we don't tie CPU to data. So all of the data is on Amazon S3, which means that on the search side, you just run a bunch of machine. You can switch it on. You can do whatever you want. And every single CPU is able to be used on every single piece of data, which is uh, great because you never waste anything. It's not as if you have a farm of um, 100 CPUs and one of them is not working because it just not, does not have any data that is important for the query that you are running at this specific time. So we, we are able to utilize uh, CPU more. And uh, yeah, just because we are uh, stateless, we can very easily uh, let our users switch on their server at night or, or on the other side, uh, just add a few servers for one day because they know that their traffic will be higher that day. Um, so here I, I, I try to explain the contrast between our approach and, uh, and the usual approach. So most of the database that you, distributed database that you uh, work with are using a shared nothing ar architecture. The idea of shared nothing is uh, you have a bunch of uh, servers, you split your data into uh, so-called shards and you dispatch uh, this piece of the data to the different servers and you try to make sure that the shards are replicated so that if one server goes down, you don't lose your data. Uh, and here the CPU can only work on the data that is hosted on the same node. And that's kind of the, the point of what I was saying before. So uh, yeah, I put two arrows, that's a very important part. Uh, so you want replica for two, two reasons, uh, just to not lose the data. So having a replica is uh, the normal way to, to deal with nodes being able to crash. And also that's, uh, if, if you are running not a log search, but like an e-commerce search or something with a lot of traffic, adding replica is a normal way to deal with um, a higher throughput. And then if you have a data set that is too large and you are doing too much computation when a query comes because maybe you have ranking or stuff like that, that's not useful in the case of QuickWit, but maybe you have too much data and in the case of QuickWit, then you do sharding, you split your, your data. Uh, so that's not what we do. Uh, so yeah, just to finish with share nothing, um, Indexing works, as I said, by pushing a document to uh, one replica and the document itself is sent to another uh, replica node and it's indexed there independently. So you, you do the work twice, which is not right. So the benefit, it, it's, it's still a, a good approach for many use cases, but not for log search. Uh, the benefit is that uh, when you run a query, the CPU is working on data that is very close to itself. So you can, you don't have to move it around, uh, which is much more efficient than trying to move the data to the CPU. One thing that happens though, uh, network is way faster nowadays. So it's uh, very different than it used to be. It's faster and faster. So nowadays people are more and more uh, turning to a shared disk architecture, which is what we use. Uh, so sh in, in our case, what it looks like is we ingest data from a distributed queue. We send them, we consume this distributed queue uh, from one or several indexing nodes. And uh, we produce uh, like files, actual files that we upload to Amazon S3. And then we uh, save the meta information on uh, PostgreSQL saying, oh, there is a new split, and from now on, searcher can search into this split. So very simple, we index every single document only once, and right after it has been indexed, we push that to Amazon S3 and it's replicated at this point. And then on the search path, uh, the search starts by going into PostgreSQL and uh, checking what are the splits that we should look into uh, to perform our search. And usually because it's logs, you have some 
extra information with the Coif instance. I'm looking into logs uh, from the last week and we are smart enough to put some metadata with the splits so that we can actually reduce uh, the scope of our search to the splits that are within our metadata that's uh, usually called uh, pruning. Uh, that's the kind of stuff, uh, all of this architecture is very close to what you will see in a product like Snowflake, except that we do that for search. And then the search nodes, uh, they are stateless, so they can search on any piece of the data. We can add server and switch off server and switch off literally everything and it's fine. Uh, it's just getting its data from Amazon S3. Uh, yeah, so I think there's a benefit that I already talked uh, about. So we don't index several times. Uh, storage is much cheaper, $25 per terabyte. And we can move stuff, uh, switch, off, switch off servers and switch on servers. Uh, so, I, is, is everyone a software engineer here? Do we have SIEs or DevOps? Oh, okay. Uh, so, what, what's a, a good load average for a system? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That depends, right? It, it depends. Great, great answer. So there's. Uh, what is, uh, so for, if, if you are looking into a server, what is a healthy system load average? So how much CPU, do you want your CPU to be used at 100% all of the time or should it be a little bit less or should it be more? I don't know. Usually you don't want more. Um, so uh, the s it's, it's a little bit of a difficult story, but um, if you are using your CPU at full capacity all of the time, then, and it's, for instance, an HTTP server, you should expect to have terrible tail latencies, and that's a very common like, problem that people have. So if you are at 90% uh, all of the time, then off, like, just by random chance, sometimes you will have uh, a bunch of requests that happen at the same time, and you will have a queue forming, and people will be waiting, and uh, it's not great. That's, uh, yeah, you, you can look into Q theory. It's actually very simple. Uh, it, if you simulate it, it looks like this. So if you have a load factor that is of, uh, uh, so here is the load factor. <laughs> and we are looking uh, here at the different curve for the, uh, different percentile. So if we look at the 90th percentile, so your server, uh, what will be the, the tail latency at the 90th uh, percentile, you see that it increases very fast uh, as the load increases. And that's just a very, very natural phenomenon. Uh, but so when, if we come back to search, indexing, it's really a, a throughput game. You, you don't have a user behind you waiting for your request, right? So you just want to have the highest possible throughput and you are perfectly happy to see your uh, CPU at 100% or 90%. So that's a good thing. Search on the other side, it's absolutely the other way around. Uh, people are waiting for their search query to finish. So you want to have uh, a load that is way lower. So by definition, you don't want to have these two things happen on the same hardware. And uh, that's what we do in our architecture. You have nodes for search and nodes for indexing. At least you can configure us like this. Uh, that's all I have. I hope I wasn't too long. Do you have questions? Yes? Size, you do not support in, uh, in your system. Yes. But uh, one type of like, mutability I was wondering is you support erasing things over time. For instance, in a logging system, you would want your logs to stay for 10 years, but you want to stay there. And I was wondering, since you are indexing things, you have an inverted index, how would you maintain this index whenever you need to remove the original 
Uh, yeah, I'm going to repeat the question because uh, I, I don't know if everyone uh, heard it. So um, the question is, I said that we are working on immutable data, but when people are working with logs, usually they want to enforce some kind of uh, retention yeah. policy. So for instance, they want to be able to remove uh, logs that are older than one month or one year or whatever. Um, so the way we build our index, uh, so we produce wait, files that are called splits. So it's a system that merge okay. them together, but it's after a while, soon. a split is con considered mature, and we don't merge it anymore. And it will be, uh, it, it comes with metadata, as I explained when I was talking about split pruning, that is saying, oh, this split only contains logs between this date and this date. So we also have a retention policy system that uh, works pretty much like a cron job and says, OK, what are the splits that are outside of the retention policy? Let's suppress them. And that's just deleting files. So it's extremely cheap, much cheaper than uh, trying to deal with Tombstone and doing some kind of uh, compact operation or stuff like that. We also have another case uh, where people want to delete documents, and it's a little bit painful for us, but we handle it. It's uh, stuff related with GDPR. So sometimes people want to be able to remove all of the information associated to uh, one user. Uh, so that kind of uh, uh, request usually happens once a day or uh, once a week, and you don't have to to handle uh, them right away. So what we do is that we have a system that uh, does a bunch of those uh, as, a, as a batch job. So it will, uh, it will queue them and then applies all of them on, on the different splits. Uh, so we handle that as well. That's the only mutability that we have. Other questions? Yes? Are, are those C moves actually faster, or in, in your real production system, it boils down to SIMD kind of mother um, parallel comparison? Uh, yeah, so the question is are the C move faster? Um, so uh, so you, you said uh, you, your question is in comparison to uh, uh, SIMD linear search or in comparison to branch code? Um, maybe maybe it's actually two questions. So the so C move depending on the processor can can introduce hazards, so it's actually slower. But I can really care about what, what's the production system look like? Does it use the same C move or something else? So C move got a bad reputation because of because of the Pentium four. It's actually very old data. Uh, so there is like some interesting threads on this. Uh, there is a historical threads, but C move on any recent processor. Uh, tend to be actually very fast today. Uh, but then, then the question is, uh, if you compare it with uh, a branch, what is, uh, is the branch very predictable or not? So if the branch is very predictable, then the CMOVE will be a little bit slower. And if the branch is very hard to predict, like in the case of a binary search, which was our, our use, use case, uh, then the CMOVE code will be much, much faster. Uh, so in our case, it was way faster, yeah. Right, right. And if I'm asking the production system, do you do like a parallel compare in your SIMD code? Uh, so yeah, we, we, we did a, a comparison. So it, it, no, it's not a, in parallel. It's not like an A-B test or something like that. It's a, it's a bench of on actual uh, data, but it's, uh, it's not in production. Okay. Yes? Uh, you said that you support like multi-tenant or you provide a multi-tenant service uh, from your system. So do you have to take account like fairness or, or speci specifically, or is that kind of a best effort thing between your tenants? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and I only have a bad answer, but so the question was, uh, I talked about multi-tenancy and uh, do we have a system to do fairness, to, to have fairness among tenants so that there is not one tenant that is using all of the CPU and the other tenant gets low queries and stuff like that. So no, we don't. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, we, we don't do anything of that but kind. Does it work well in like, practice? No. <laughs> no, no. Uh, the only thing that we do is that we have a system to 
So, so it's another part where we are very nice with people with a multi-tenant use case. Uh, so we so bu bu uh, building a search index is something that is very expensive, but building 1,000 search index that are very small at the same time is something that is terribly hard. And every single index has a memory footprint that is quite important. Uh, and we kind of solve that problem, uh, so that's what we are good at. And then we have this split pruning system that makes it nice. You, when you search into your data, you're not searching into the rest of the world, so it's efficient. Uh, yeah, but we don't have anything to, to isolate tenants uh, in, in terms of resources. Yes. Uh, does can, can 5 p uh, does it have any uh, like P99 uh, better performance than um, than Lucene based on not not using the garbage cluster and, and other vagaries like that? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I looked into that a little bit. Yes. It's yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the long story short is uh, uh, yes. Uh, the variance is much better than what you will see uh, with Lucene. I. Uh, don't show the kind of information in the benchmark that kind of voluntary because so the, I, I use this benchmark uh, myself to improve the performance of uh, on TV. So it's not it's not a benchmark that I use to boast. <laughs> I use it to to know where like, actually there are queries where Lucene is uh, faster than us, and that's very interesting for us because that means that there is something that you get dig it to. And also, you've seen that there was this uh, search engine called PISA that is faster than us as well, uh, this academic search engine. Uh, so yeah, this search engine is mostly to f for search professionals, so Lucene people are looking at it as well, uh, to, to look at the result and, and discuss. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I don't care about like making fun of uh, Java GC or <laughs> stuff like that. But that's a good point though. So especially in distributed uh, search, variance is really important, right? Because when you do a distributed computation, you are as slow as the slowest of the piece of your computation. So if you have a high variance, uh, you are, the latency that you experience is the max of the different stuff that you do. And so it really destroys your distribution way more than if it was uh, flat. So it's, uh, it's much better. Yes? Yes, so the question is, have we tried to use our system for uh, metrics? So we uh, do handle, uh, we, we do have aggregation like Elastic, it's actually the same API. Uh, we, we, we haven't used it all that much, to be honest. Uh, right now, we are focusing mostly on logs and recently on tracing. And uh, metrics will probably come at one point. But uh, uh, I, I'd love at one point to actually have a, a full-fledged time series, so go beyond what, uh, what Elastic does on this. Uh, yeah, so sorry, I, I don't have a great story to tell. Uh, great presentation. Thank you, Paul. Uh, just a couple of more things before you all go and uh, chat. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming. Uh, this is my first time organizing the meetup. Uh, raise your hand if it's also your first time at the Tokyo Rust meetup. Yeah, a lot of new people. That's great. Uh, so my plan is to have at least one meetup every month. And kind of the bottleneck is finding presenters, like people who want to talk about the project, uh, something that they've learned. So if you feel like there is something you want to talk about, um, one of your projects or something uh, that you think was difficult to learn about Rust uh, or some success story, whether you use it at work, um, please send me a message. And that's going to be a really big help for me. Or if you know someone else 
um, also super helpful. All right, so that's all for today. Thank you for Paul for presenting. And uh, the pizza has arrived. A little bit of a technical difficulty is they are smaller than we had expected. So we ordered more. Uh, more food is coming. Please don't worry. And uh, let's go and enjoy the food and the drinks. Thank you. <laughs>